What's happening, everybody? Welcome into a brand new episode of Crossed Up, the first Crossed Up of the 2024 season. Anthony Sanfilippo's here, and I am Bob Wankel. And Anthony, I'm I'm going to bring you in here in a second. Um, I'm going to be honest with the listeners here to to start the year. I want to make sure that we get off on a on an honest and and truthful page. You know, you and I haven't really talked all that much recently. A couple text messages here and there. Uh, I saw you uh, at uh, at an event, I guess, about a month ago and caught up a little bit. But other than that, really haven't talked a whole lot. And that kind of leads me to this question. Who have you talked to more since the end of last baseball season? Me or John Tortorella? (laughs) It's a great question. Um, uh, well, up until about a month ago, I would have said John Tortorella, but I've talked to you more in the last month. So, <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> uh, well, you know, I, I, I have a feeling that you and Rob probably won't, uh, have a, a similar dynamic here this, this no. season. If I had to go out on a limb, I have some thoughts on that, but, uh, not my place to, to give them. But anyway, it's very good to talk to you. I'm excited that we're back doing this. Uh, we'll be back on the two shows per week schedule here. Uh, We'll kind of iron out the details. We were good about it, though. You know, for Mm. for those of you that have been with us for a long time, you know that we weren't always the best about being on schedule and sticking to the plan. But last year, if you kind of jumped into the show, you knew that we were there for you twice a week. And that's definitely the expectation coming back this year. We have a lot of plans for the show, really hoping to kind of have it take a step forward. We know that there's some other good Phillies podcasts out there, but we've always been real proud of the work that we've done. And and we kind of think it's sort of time for this thing to, to kind of take it up a notch. And so uh, we're really, really looking forward to it coming into this season. A lot of expectations with the Phillies. We have a lot of expectations for the show too. So uh, I guess let's not really waste too much more time here. I mean, uh, here, here's where I'm at. You know, last we talked, it was sort of Jesus, how disappointing was this, you know, and and we kind of had to absorb what happened in game six and seven of the NLCS. And, And certainly I think everyone agrees that the Phillies missed a, a heck of an opportunity and sort of where I left it and where I myself arrived at this off season was not that the Phillies can't win a world series in 2024 or in the next three or four years. I, I don't know how big the window is. I, I don't really buy into that all that much, but the one thing I, I do have a hard time with, and I think that a lot of fans are going to have a hard time with coming into the season is feeling like it could be a good year. It could be an exciting year, but my God, they are never going to get, a spot better to win a championship, to have it sort of all line up, at least in my opinion, than they did last year. Two shots at home against an inferior opponent. You have two of your better pitchers on the mound. Man, they, I, like it's still, even all these months later for me, it's hard to just be like, okay, no big deal. Let's, let's go get them. Yeah, I agree, Bob. And, and the thing is, is that we'll for, we will forget last year if they win. A championship. If they win championship this year, last year just becomes a footnote in the in the in yeah. the path to get to that World Series, right? World Series title. Um, but I agree with you. I mean, it they were there were there has never been a situation in my lifetime for a Philadelphia sports team to be set up to win a championship as well as the Phillies were set up last year, and then not come through. I mean, yeah. there have been teams that you've been disappointed in and say, oh, they should have won that year. They should have won that year. But it was never set up as well as it was set up. You slayed the dragon by beating the Braves, who were the best team in baseball. You you got a break in in a sense of of facing an inferior Arizona team. And then you had them beat. You had them up. You were up 3-2 coming home for two games in red October. I mean, you couldn't have asked for anything better. And the the way things were breaking in the American League – I mean, Texas, you know, they got hot in the playoffs. K- kudos to them. They won a World Series. But the, the they were beating Houston, who was the team that yeah. you worried a little bit about. So, like, it was all set up, and then it just didn't happen. So, I think, yeah. that, I think that you're right. I mean, it's – it's and it's part of the reason – we're going to get into this, too. It's part of the reason why I think that they really decided, let's run it back this year. Because they know they had a championship team and, and let it drop, and they don't want to – they want to go back and get it with that group. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, listen, I know you're you're a little bit older than I am. I'm 38, and I know that as you have that conversation about, 
you know, give me the Mount Rushmore of, of blown opportunities in Philadelphia sports. I, you know, my mind always goes back to the 2002 Eagles. But even now, and I know it requires a little bit of revisionist history because I know how the city felt about that team and felt about that game against Tampa Bay in the NFC Championship game that year. It really felt like it was the Eagles' turn. The Bucks can't win in cold weather. The Eagles had dominated that series head-to-head um, the, the couple years prior. But, you know, you look at it and you're like, Tampa Bay was really good. They right. had some all-time greats defensively. I know Brad Johnson wasn't anything to write home about. And I know that you had in the Super Bowl a, a Raiders team that was just ready to be steamrolled. But, you know, Donovan McNabb wasn't healthy in that game, right? Like, and I don't want to turn this into an Eagles podcast, but it's easy now to kind of look at it and be like, it wasn't quite the slam dunk we all thought it was. Right. There's no way you can evaluate, no matter how you slice the, the 2023 NLCS, I mean, it was just unacceptable. It was just crazy that they couldn't, they could not find a way. And I mean, I know it's baseball. I know it's random. Things happen any given night, but man, two times, two shots, the way it lined up. I just don't know that you ever forget about it unless, as you said, they go on to win the World Series this year. And I guess that kind of brings us to the starting point of this whole thing. You kind of mentioned it. They were not particularly active this offseason. In fairness, if you look at the way that teams spent this winter, it was really the Dodgers just going insane. And then when you account for the NOLA contract, the Phillies were about as aggressive as any other team in free agency, just in terms of total spend. But what they did was they, they brought back their entire roster as is. And then we had the Whit Merrifield signing, which we'll talk a little bit about later in the show. I, I guess as a fan, like, do you look at this and you kind of say like, look, this was a really good team. There was a slow start again. You know, Bryce Harper wasn't there. Trey Turner kind of needed to get his stuff together. Like you can kind of piece this thing together, and I, I can tell you all the reasons that the Phillies will be better this season. Full year of Harper, healthy Harper. Uh, you know, Trey Turner becomes more of the player that we saw down the stretch for 162 games. You know, maybe a guy like Alec Bohm takes an incremental step forward. Maybe there's a little bit more in Bryson Stott's game. Uh, the, the rotation is still really good. Like, there's a lot of things to like about the Phillies, and I think that this is what's so strange about the way that this season sets up. Because the offseason was admittedly underwhelming, especially as you see the Dodgers do what they did. And especially, you, you know, the, the Braves, I, I don't know. You know, I, I know I think the Braves are better than the Phillies on paper. I think it'll play out that way over 162 games again. But, you know, like I, I know that not nobody at this point is really scared of the Braves come October, nor should they be. But it's like, how how do you evaluate it? Is it fair to say, like, damn, I feel really good. I should feel great about this Phillies team. Or is it like, yo, guys, like, all you did was bring back Aaron Nola, who, by the way, we spent five months talking about last year. Like, hey, should we even bring this guy back? Like, is that enough? Like, what, like, what, what is the starting point for this team coming in? Yeah, it's and, and it's funny because – it's probably the reason we didn't talk a lot in the last couple months, Bob, because they didn't do anything. I, I, I believe the last episode we did was when they signed Nola, and we said, "Okay, at, we'll we'll do another episode as something happens with it here in the off season." <laughs> and then nothing happened in the off season. So well, you we know, it's like I, I said to you, I was like, "I'm like Punxsutawney Phil, right? Like I emerged <laughs> in February. Like I I always sort of am that guy in the off season. Like yes. you know, like the cadence of my job. Like listen, you're covering the Phillies for Crossing Broad again on a, a full time basis or almost full time basis. I'll probably do the the chip in thing again, cover yeah. 20, 20 games maybe max. I just you know the way that my job works, like I have to put my head down and basically just not pay attention to anything between you know, mid-October, end of October, and and the end of the Super Bowl. And then after yeah. the Super Bowl, I kind of come up for air, and I'm like, let's do the Phillies again. <laughs> well, this was a great offseason for me because I didn't miss anything with my head in the sand for four months. That's right. You didn't miss a, a damn thing. So, no, it was – no, and I, I – it, it's part of, part of me looks at this and says, I get it. I completely get it, and I understand it, and I appreciate the approach that the Phillies have taken because I, I'm a big believer in 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 team – Right. And, you know, I know, you know, I, I'm 50 now. Right. I just turned 50. So I, I talk about it as team. I think younger people look at it as vibes. Right. And say, well, what's the vibe? Right. With the team. But the, but that's really what it is. Like you you get a group of guys that you really like being around and you really want to be with and you want to win with them. And if you the, the more 
chances you get to win with the same group of people, the better chance of it happening. If it's a, obviously if it's a good team, if it's a bad team, no. But if it's a good team, the better your chance is. So there's part of me that goes, I, I'm all in with that idea. I like that idea. But there's also part of me that looks at it and says there were deficiencies in this setup last year that came around, came uh, came up and at the worst possible time yeah. and hurt you. And we don't see any kind of adjustment to that. Now, that doesn't mean it, ha- it can't still happen. I think that the Phillies looked at it and said, we don't have that depth in the upper minor leagues to be, to do it internally. So we're going to hope that this guy and this guy and this guy can come through. And then if not, all right, we'll look at it come July. And if we have to trade assets at that point, we will. But let's go into the season with what we have and then see. So that could still happen. But I do I do feel like there are small little red flags, not big ones, but small little red flags around the roster that were there at the end of last year that are still there now. And you say to yourself, if those rear their ugly head again, do we look back and say, well, why didn't you fix it when you could when you had a chance to? Right. And I'm actually comfortable with the idea of saying, hey, we really like our team. Let's let's get it going here. Let's see if we get off to a better start. Like, I think it's reasonable to expect that this team is not going to be 22 and 30 after 52 games this year. I, you know, they better not be. I'll, I'll say that. There's there's two different things that you just kind of pointed out that I, I want to uh, kind of maybe elaborate on a little bit. You know, people talk about vibes. Like, we talked about vibes last year. And I know a lot of people are sort of done with the vibe thing and the chemistry of this clubhouse. It's one of the things that we talked up quite a bit the the past couple years, that these guys really do have a special connection. The chemistry really, truly is strong in that clubhouse. And people are going to dismiss that because of the way that last season ended. Like, if you're a pessimist or you're someone that's a little bit overhearing about that, I get it. I mean, you say like, all right, well, what did vibes do for them when they had the entire city at their back and all the momentum in the world at the end of the NLCS last year and they couldn't figure it out? Like so much for the Phillies killer vibes. I would argue, though, that like maybe maybe the vibes isn't what that takes you over the top come October, but over a grueling six and a half month schedule, you know, I, I think that vibes do matter. Like I do think that like that that you know, cohesiveness and that chemistry does matter. I think it Mm -hmm. pushes you through some of the slumps. It pushes you through some of the hard times on the schedule and it helps get you to that finish line. And then you have to execute when it matters. Like, I think that the chemistry is more about the big picture than it is isolating in a a singular game, you know? So I do think it matters. And I think it's insane that people are kind of like, I don't want to hear any more about vibes. I don't want to hear any more about intangibles. I'm like, man, like that's it's a huge. real big part of what this mix is. Like, yeah. I, I don't think that the result last year necessarily means that it it, it isn't as good as what people thought it was. No, hundred. You you said that about as best as it could be said about this thing. Yes, you're right. The vibes are not going to win you a championship, but the vibes will get you into position to win a championship. Yeah, and then and then your best players have to be your best players. And let's be honest. I mean, I mean when things were going great against Atlanta, was anybody complaining about the vibes? Right yeah. when the things were rolling and Castellanos was killing the Braves and uh and and Turner was having a great series and everything and everybody was just rolling. And, well, you and, know, and, we we and, like Garrett Stubbs, right? He was on the show yeah. and we hope to have him again and all that stuff. But you know, it was kind of funny at the end of last year watching people being like, "Get this guy out of here!" Like yeah. all he does is press play on the Spotify list. Like fuck this guy. I'm like, well, well, like come on, man. <laughs> Phillies didn't lose the NLC la- uh, NLCS yeah. last year because. You know, Garrett Stubbs told Scott Lauber that, like, yeah, if we win it, I'll, I'll probably jump in the pool. Like, I, yeah, I know yeah. that, like, Tori Lavallo tried to make that a little bit of a thing. And I would have, too, if I were them. Like, I would have been yeah. grasping for whatever I could get, you know. But, you know, I, I just I, I think that a lot of that got, you know, people were just so frustrated with the way that things played out that, you know, I think that we're starting to maybe discount and dismiss some things that are still really important. That being said, though, you know, before the Merrifield signing, there was a possibility. Like if you go through the exercise of what does this opening day roster look like that Mm -hmm. every single player on the opening day roster at some point would have been on the 2023 Phillies. Like when you talk about nothing being different, I mean, we were working towards a potential extreme of no turnover. Um, 
are we like letting these guys off the hook though a little bit? Like I know that there's frustration and I know that there's optimism, but like here's where I think things get a little bit murky. You have to give the Phillies credit right now coming in. I think that they're one of three teams that can win the National League in mm -hmm. 2024. I think, you know, certainly the Dodgers, certainly the Braves. I think the Phillies are there. And, I, you know, Vegas, Vegas, odds makers sort of bear that out. I mean, the Dodgers win total set at 103 and a half, which is absurd. I believe that the 99 Yankees are the only other team that have had anywhere near that, like, you know, in terms of like 103, 104 coming in. The Braves are at 101, 101 and a half, depending on where you're looking. The Phillies are 90 and a half. That's pretty damn high, man. Yeah. So they're kind of caught in this in-between where you're like, all right, the Phillies have built a really good team. They've shown us the last two years that they're going to be in the mix. They can be in the mix to win it all. But like, are we sort of like letting them off the hook a little bit? That like we're we're coming into a season where we're again, we're basically saying, well, the Braves are probably going to pummel them and win the division by two weeks. And like, hey, you know, when we get to October, we'll show them what's up again. <laughs> While that may be the ultimate outcome, I, I get a sense this year, Bob, that they're going to – that one of the things that's important to the Phillies this year that maybe wasn't as important last year or wasn't as important the year before is getting off to a better start and, and not falling out of the division race right away. But look, they may eventually not beat out the Braves. The Braves may eventually win the National League East, and the Phillies are a wild card team again. Um, but I don't think this is going to be, we're going to be at the end of May being like, all right, let's start looking at the wild card standings. Cause they're not right. catching Atlanta. I think this is a season where they're actually going to come in and, and be competitive for the division. They may not pull it out in the end. Right. But I think that when you look at that over under number being 90 and a half, and I think that it's like, you know, early indications to me are they will probably be over it. I think slightly. I don't think it's like, oh, the Phillies are a hundred win team, but sure. I do think that they'll probably beat that 90 and a half. Um, uh, and I'm not certain that the Braves, I, I think that the Braves are going to be under their number. Um, I, well, I just, similarly, yeah. like for the Phillies, it's important, right? Do yeah. you think that there's anything with Atlanta this year that's like, we did this the last two years. We won all these games. Like maybe well, we can ease off the gas a little bit. Yeah, and that's funny. I was just—I was just about to say it because, you know, we talked about this. I don't remember what episode it was, but we were talking about how the Braves were talking about all season how their best players played every game of the season. Like they don't take it, you know, they don't take the break, the days off. They go out there and they just pummel you night in and night out. I think the Braves are going to look at it and be like, okay, maybe that wasn't the right approach. Yeah, you know, I think the, but I also so with that in mind. I don't think the Braves are going to have as historic an offensive season as they had last year. It's kind of hard to match what they did a year ago. Right. Right? As great as those players are, it's hard to match that. And I don't love their pitching. I don't love it. It's their starting pitching, especially. It's okay. It's good. Strider's a good pitcher. I mean, they got good pitching, but it's not blow you away pitching. And so, right. like, when I look at 101 or whatever, whatever it is that they are, their over under number, I think. The Braves are probably in that 96 win category. And the Phillies are probably in that 92 win category. And so I think, that, you know, that is a that is a gap that is – you can make that up. Right. Um, and, but the question then becomes, did they do enough to make that up? And I don't, I don't know if they have. And I, you know, we will find out if Johan Rojas can play every day in center field. We will find out if, in fact, not adding another starting pitcher is okay with the considering the five guys that you're going to bring back as Christopher Sanchez going to have a full season akin to what he had at the end of last year. We're going to find out if Orion Kirkering can step in and be a back end of the bullpen guy for a full major league season. Like those are the three things in the three spots to me. Well, the fourth was an outfielder. They went and got Merrifield, so okay, fine. But those were the four I four spots that I was worried about going into the offseason, and they only addressed one of them in my mind. Do you think it matters? And, and, and I'm actually, like, I'm staying, like, on this, like, macro thing because what yeah. you're bringing up, these are all really important questions that we need to address and, and talk yeah. about. I'm, like, trying to get there. Like, I'm, yeah, I'm we'll trying to like, get used to it. I guess the, the question that I have for you, though, is like, do you think it matters that the Phillies are more competitive in the division this year? Like, is it kind of time for like, I don't want to say for them to grow up, but like, there's like a little bit of me that's like, you, you have to. And, and people go, why? Why? You don't have to. You, th we've seen the last two years exactly why you don't have to. And I get it. And, and I sat here on this show last year and I was like, 
they, you know, this is embarrassing. When they got off to that start that they got off to, I'm like, are we really doing this again? Are we yeah. really going to watch this team lose the division by 15 games again and kind of like not back their way into the playoffs? They, they won, they solidified their playoff position early in the final month of the season. So it's not like they backed in, but like, damn, dude, like, you, you kind of want to see a little bit more. Like, let's get a division race going here. Like, let's look at the standings on September 7th and say, hey, there's a big series coming up. They get two out of three. They're going to be right there. Like, th those are, to me, like, you cannot. And I, I'm going to play the hits here because I did say it last year and I, I sounded like an idiot, but I'm going to say it again. You can't just rely on this formula of, like, let's just get in. Like, you got to I know it's worked for them to a degree. They haven't won a championship, so it hasn't really worked for them. But, like, I know it's gotten them past Atlanta in October, but I just do not think that you can keep relying on a formula that's like we don't need to be nearly competitive with the, the, the closest team that we're chasing in the division because we'll just – We'll just rally in October. Like, I am a little tired of seeing that. And I'm not saying that they can't do it again. I'm not saying that that they're that they would be an afterthought in the postseason coming in if that's what happens. But like to me, like you've got to compete. Like you've you've got to have a little pride and you've got to compete with this team this year. Yeah, I, I agree. And and you know, it's funny because the last two years I've been the guy who sat here and said, just get in. And I still believe the mantra of mm -hmm. just get in and you'll see what happens because that's just that's just the nature of the sport, right? I mean, it, it, you know, I've been I've been the one yelling from the rooftops since they announced the additional wild card team two years ago that you're only making this harder on division winners uh, in the playoffs. An odd number of teams in the in the playoffs that with more than one wild card game is going to impact. Teams at the and they're you know there's about two years of small sample size. Let's wait and see. We got to you know go forward. Blah blah blah. I'm telling you, it's it, it affects them. They will never use it as an excuse, but it does. So I'm of the mindset that you just get in. But I'm also somebody who talks a lot about calendar and talks a lot about the schedule. And the one thing that's different about the Philly schedule this year than it was either of the last two years is it's very road heavy at the end of the season. Now I say it's funny I say that because I know at the end of 2022 they had to go to Washington and go to Houston and then uh -huh. St. Louis and then you know first two games in Atlanta. So they were all, they were away from home for a while, but that was at the that was because of a um uh you know the covid thing that bumped the Astros series at the end of the year and then there was they started the playoffs on the road. So it was a combination of the two. But if you look over the last 6 weeks of the season this year, the Phillies have 22 road games over the last six weeks of the season. I think they only have like 14 home games or 13 home games. You're you're going to be traveling a lot. It's Atlanta and Kansas. Kansas City's better team now. Toronto, Miami, Milwaukee, the Mets and Washington. That's you're going you're going yeah. to places, okay? The, you can't put yourself into a spot where you need to start winning late in the year to get into the playoffs. You have to be in a better position before that because of how hard that schedule is. So I think it's even that much more important for the Phillies to get off to a good start and to be competitive in the division, even if ultimately you don't win the division and are a wild card team again. And that's OK if you are, but you don't want to be putting yourself in a position to chase a wild card spot down while you have to be traveling as much as they have to travel at the end of the year. Yeah, I think that that's a really good point. Um, you know. I, I think one of the the other thoughts I've had about how do you process this team, how do you process this upcoming season, is like how do you watch the Phillies this year? And so I'll ask you this question. Um, are you sort of uh, with a lot of people in this city that have adopted this mentality with the Sixers that like, hey, get talk to me in the second round? Are you there with the Sixers? No. Nah, well, I mean, right now I am a little bit more because Embiid's been out, right? You right. Know, he's been hurt, so – I mean, there's not. I, I I've been to a couple of Sixers games for the AP, and I'm just right. like, I'm, and I'm watching them, and I'm like, yeah, this you got to wait. <laughs> there's nothing. Yeah. Like, there's nothing to see here until Embiid can play basketball again. So, yeah, like, admittedly, like yeah. I'm not a, a huge Sixers fan. You know, I, if you've listened to the show over time, like I'm a, a insane person when it comes to the Eagles. I'm apathetic uh, to to hockey, and you know, the Sixers. I root for them, uh, but yeah. I don't. You know, I just don't invest a lot of emotional energy in it. Yeah. Phillies, I have this weird cover them used to be super fan guy thing going on. And, you know, I guess for me, I, I've heard a lot of people say like, hey, for, for me, it's it's the Sixers. Like, like, the Phillies are now the Sixers where it's like 
Hey, talk to me in the talk to me in October. Talk to me in the second round. Talk to me in the NLCS. And I'm like, man, like I, I, I get the sentiment, but I also look at it and say, like, if you love the Phillies or you love baseball, there's so many different things to follow and kind of see how they evolve as the season goes on. Like right off the bat, like if you if you love the Phillies and you're in and you're you're you care about this team, like. Don't you want to see what the move of Bryce Harper to first base does for him? Like, how does he play the position? How does he fare defensively? Does it kind of spark him offensively? Does he have that monster year that we're kind of expecting him to have? What does Kyle Schwarber look like now that he's off his feet and not running around on left field every day? You know, can Johan Rojas take the next step? You know, uh, you look at the staff, like can Nola be the guy that you just paid him to be? What does Zach Wheeler look like? You could go up and down the list and talk about each individual player and, and be fascinated by a lot. To me, I think there's a lot of fascinating storylines and things that that certainly bear watching as this thing unfolds. I just can't get to that place where it's like, hey, this is a bottom line business. Like if you can't enjoy the the, the day in, day out, like the the, the process of of the season I, I just i don't know i don't know how you consume 162 games of baseball and say like yeah that was cool but talk to me like, when they play atlanta or la yeah it's a, it's a, i think it's a little bit different right now bob i you know i think people are, are jumping to conclusions by comparing them to the sixers a little bit i mean sixers haven't gotten past the second round in 20 years right yeah. i mean the, the phillies have had two seasons one where they got to the world series and one where they got to within one game of the world series i mean you ask any team in any sport given in back-to-back seasons yeah. if they could do you be know in how those hard sports, that is to if do? they could be in those spots <laughs> yeah. in any sport they would take yeah. it right i mean so so you can't i don't think i think it's it's unfair to the phillies to sit there and say talk to me in the second round you know or whatever yeah. or, but so i think that it's, it's a little bit now if they continue if they go into the playoffs again this year and get bounced you know in the division series or something like that or or go into the nlcs and lose again maybe not not go game seven but lose in like five or whatever then yeah i could start to see maybe in 25 you start to say all right when are you taking that next step right. but it's kind of it's really hard to kind of put that kind of label on this phillies team at this juncture so one of the things i i definitely want to talk about is the the signing that the phillies or the you know the, the most important, or I guess the headline signing here is of the, the Whit Merrifield deal, which happened uh, on Friday. You know, when I saw it, I said, okay, well, this makes a lot of sense. There's, there's some positional positional versatility here. Maybe not as much. I think it, his versatility has actually been a little bit overstated, frankly, like oh, mm -hmm. I can play anywhere. I'm like, not really. Not um, anymore anyway. No, no, he's he's really a second baseman who can kind of go stand out in left field if you need him to. And yeah, and that's that's fine. You know, there's some versatility there. Um, you you know, he was an all-star last year, and you, you feel good about it. He's a name that you you've kind of heard for a while, and, and you say, like, this guy can play a little bit, he's a veteran. Um, I, I don't see a ton of downside to it, I, I suppose, but you know you really can open it up and say like, all right, like he stole 26 bases last year, but he was thrown out 10 times. Like he's not a tremendous base stealer. Like there's not any, you know, a plus characteristic about his game at this point. And the reason why I say that is because it's sort of, I think this signing is in a way emblematic of like where the Phillies are from a depth standpoint, like Whit Merrifield makes the Phillies better. Like, there's no question that they are now deeper and better and have more versatility than they previously did. And for that reason, I understand why they did the deal. And I, I while I wasn't saying, like, wow, what an incredible move. This is going to take them over the top. I get the deal. And, and I don't really have a lot of negative things to say about it. But if there is something negative to be said about it, it's this. It's like you again now are utilizing a bench spot for an older player that doesn't have a, a tremendous amount of upside. Like there's no intrigue there. There's no, there's no like, Hey, maybe this guy actually has a ton more. He's first of all, it, it's the, the, the player isn't young and that there is no, like, let's see if this guy can actually evolve and become something like there is none of that. Like that's, that's where you kind of, I don't want to say like you miss me with this, but like, the Phillies really do like lack the depth, like the intriguing bench depth where maybe you get a little bit more than what you expected. Like this bench is still totally lackluster in my mind and it is now better. But again, like where's the freaking upside on this bench? Well, okay. And, and 
I want to go in a little bit different direction with, with Merrifield because I really like the signing. And, and I'm going to give you I'm going to give you the the dates, these three dates, and see if you can maybe put this put this puzzle together. This might be a little bit challenging, but I'm going to do it this way and see if you can go with me on this. Uh, so the, the three dates I want to give you: July 28th, 2015; December 8th, 2015; February 16th, 2024. I have no clue. What if I said, to, "All right, let me let me throw some teams at you with those first two dates." <laughs> I'm gonna throw some teams at you. Yeah, I had some beers last night. I told you this, and it's yeah, I know. That's early, right. That's so, right. I'm gonna know. throw a couple teams. Not everything's you. firing here right so, now. So, so the July 28th date relates to the Kansas City Royals. The December 2015 date relates to the Chicago Cubs, and the February date obviously refers to the Phillies. Okay, now just go ahead. The July date was when the Kansas City Royals traded for Ben Zobrist. Okay. And the Cubs signed him in December of 2015. Mm -hmm. He went on to be a part-time player, kind of in the way that the Phillies are going to likely use Merrifield and was a difference maker for the Royals to win the World Series in 2015. And then obviously with the game-winning hit in the World Series for the Cubs in 2016, at age 35, mind you. Mm -hmm. um, which is the same age as uh, as Merrifield, and they're very similar players. Play multiple positions. By that point in their careers, we're, we're mostly second baseman who you could put out in left field and make a play for you. Um, but the the reality was they didn't have to be everyday guy. He didn't have, Zobers didn't have to be an everyday guy, and was and was really good. Merrifield last year through July, and Toronto used him as an everyday player last year. Mm -hmm. Through the end of July, he hit like 306, and he was really good. And then in August and September, he fell off the table because he just his body was wearing down. At this age, you're not a you can't play 160 games, right? I mean, you, you yeah, I mean, I, I have it right here because I figured we were going to do this, and so you know, from August 1st on, 196 plate appearances over 47 games, he hit 212 with a 538 OPS. Yeah, yeah, it was not good. So I mean, that's my that's my point. It's like if you're if he's used properly, uh, and when I mean properly, I say three starts a week, right? You know, and then comes off the bench once or twice as a pinch hitter. I, I think that you're going to get the still the best version of Whit Merrifield that you used to get. I mean, he was an all star last year for a reason because up to that point. He was one of the better players in the American League. Deserved that all-star nod last year. It wasn't just some kind of, oh, here's a cute veteran player. We're going to throw him the right. all-star nod, right? He deserved it last year. Yeah. He couldn't, couldn't finish the season, right? He broke down. His body was breaking down. But it was showing, okay, here's a guy that's still got something, but not as an everyday player. And so, like, that's why I like it. I think this is a really good signing. And while I get it, you're right. It would be so much better if you had somebody who's got a little bit of upside going forward into the future and say this guy could maybe eventually be a starter for your team. Or, or, you know, he's a young player who's getting a chance to play. Yeah. A lot of a lot of really good teams have those guys, and the Phillies don't. So, But this is the alternative, and it's it's not the most ideal, but it's pretty darn good considering. Yeah. And I mean, again, to be, to be totally clear here, like I'm in favor of the signing. I'm it, it's more of like, to me, uh, the complaint is more about the, the roster building and like big picture construction and the lack of that player that I'm talking about. It has nothing to do with Whit Merrifield, you know, it has nothing yeah. to do with, in fact, like I do think he's going to make this team better. And for a lot of the reasons that you're saying, and one of the things you kind of even look at, you know, I feel like that this team is very split heavy. It's very the, the platoon splits often get extreme one way or the other. He's he's pretty consistent, lefty righty. Like I don't think you have to really worry about that a ton. The bulk of his at bats last year game against right handers. He actually hit better in terms of average against righties than he did left handers last year. Uh, the the power numbers were a little bit better against lefties, but I just. I just would like to see them get to a place like to be completely selfish. I like the idea of a really solid veteran player coming in, as you said, maybe spells a couple different guys, gets up to three starts a week, decent bat off the bench. It just would be nice to have that other guy as well, you know? And I think that that's really kind of my, it, it highlights the complaint, I guess is the best way to say it for me. 
Yeah. And that's fair. Um, I got to, I want to share something with you, uh, on Merrifield. Um, I'm not going to say who this is from, but it's from a college coach who is, um, intimately familiar with the blue Jays organization. Okay. Let's put it that way. Uh, and this was a this is a text from him. I'm going to read it exactly. Uh, absolutely love Merrifield. Awesome dude. Plays hard as fuck. Great teammate. <laughs> plays anywhere. He's fast as fuck, and his baseball IQ is through the roof. I think seven million for him is a steal. Toronto wanted him back, but the structure of their team needed some more pop because of the other guys that lack power numbers. Hence them adding Turner. Merrifield is great though. Uh, he's really humble and he's a great guy fit right in with the Phillies. Well, that's good. I mean, Hey, listen, you know, we're sitting here talking about vibes and chemistry and it's, it's nice to hear that, you know, from a sounds like that, that kind of just rolls into what they already have going on, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so okay. I, mean, I, I, I look at it. I, I so look you, at have it him, positive. you have him uh, being a top 10 MVP candidate in the national <laughs> league. <this year. laughs> no, but what he is, is certainly, I think he's going to play against left-handed pitching. Right. I think that's certainly going to be a thing, whether it's in left field, giving Marsh a day or giving Stott a day at second base. He's going to play against left handed pitching and he offers you a short term fill in if Rojas does not pan out as a hitter and you you slide Marsh back to center field. You play Merrifield and left and, and, and it gives you it gives you at least while your defense takes a hit, not a major hit, but it takes a hit. It, it at least gives you better offense. Did did I just read something over the last few months where, you know, I, I felt like certainly Johan Rojas defensively is outstanding and he gave the Philly some really quality at bats uh, during the, the latter stages of last season. The playoffs were a disaster. We don't need to, you know, belabor the point, but I, I feel like everything sort of unfolds last year. And we're like, this guy's not going to be in the major leagues to start next season. Like, he just mm -hmm. needs more time. It's obvious. And something has happened. Nothing has happened, but something has happened since then where we're like, oh, the Phillies really want Johan Rojas to win the opening day spot out in center. Like, they're what? What? Yeah. I well, So, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting to me because if you remember, you know, when we had the NOLA press conference, you know, then we were talking to Dombrowski off to the side. And he was not as adamant <laughs> that Johan Rojas was even going to make the roster. Yeah. Like, I mean, it was the conversation that we were having with him that day at that press conference was more sounding like we believe in Johan Rojas, but he might need to go down to the minors for a little bit and work on hitting. And now all of a sudden he's ready to go. And yeah. so how do you get there? Just yeah. by having off-season batting cage workouts like that, I don't, I, I don't yeah. believe in it, right? And uh, I, know I, I just, I, I roll my eyes. I, I've gotten yeah. cranky as I've gotten older, but like the <laughs> best shape of my life, fifteen pounds of muscle thing. Like, I remember doing that with with Eagles, you know, for years. Yeah. Like Sean Considine and Mark Simino, and oh, they got bigger this off-season. Or Alec Bohm, Alec Bohm last yeah. year, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? last year with Alec Bohm and fifteen pounds of muscle. You, you know what I, I believe, uh, you know, listen, I, I think that Nick Castellanos finds a way to get you 70 extra base hits and probably drives you absolutely crazy while, while getting there. And Schwarber's going to do his, can this guy even play baseball? And then he's going to go crazy and be the best player on the planet for three weeks. We know that's all going to happen. Real Muto, is this is, is JT Real Muto still a top five catcher? Like, we'll have that conversation at some point because he's going to go 30 games where he hits 170. Like, and then he's going to go crazy. Like we know what the Phillies are. Like a lot of these guys, like we know what's going to happen. We know what they're going to give them barring injury. What I don't know is what Johan Rojas is. And like, I fear that there's this idea that, well, you know, this offense is so good. This lineup is so deep that they, they don't need him to hit 250. They don't need him to hit 220. He can right. just go out there and get it. Like that's not good enough for me. Like right. it isn't. And I'm not saying that, that he won't hit, 250 or that he can't or that he will in time will not evolve into that player but like right now like i am a little bit concerned like if you ask me like what what are your concerns on this roster like there's a lot of them but i still know that there's like a baseline to expect and that's why i mentioned some of those veterans here i go okay 
what if Brandon Marsh can't hit left-handed pitching like at all? Because he didn't really as the season progressed last year. You recall, mm -hmm. like he got off to a great start against left-handed pitching. We're like, why the hell is he not in the lineup? This is crazy. They were protecting him because they knew that there was going to be a regression. And that regression still happened in those spots where he took on lefties. Not that he was a disaster, but like he was not able to consistently handle it from the left side. Right. So what happens now if he continues to be that guy? And Johan Rojas can't hit at all. And now you're like talking about Whit Merrifield and the perfect situation is that man, he plays second base a couple times, maybe he goes out and plays left field. That's great. Well, like what happens if this turns into a total disaster? I'm not saying that Marsh won't be productive to, to a degree, but like what happens if Rojas is a, a disaster? And, you know, now Marsh is being asked to do a little bit more than maybe what they'd like him to do. And oh, by the way, he's not going to be ready to go until the end of spring training. I would imagine, knowing the Phillies, they're probably going to be a little bit conservative with him, even if he's on the opening day roster. I, I think that they're going to say, like, all yeah. right, well, he's a little bit behind schedule. we got to ease him into this. Like, my fear is that, like, have you left yourself woefully short at a very at, – in a place that was an obvious deficiency all year long or, you know, all winter long? And, like, yeah, Whit Merrifield's a, a good ad, but, like, is that enough? You know, yeah. and that's that to me is the concern. Yeah, and I think that they look at it and say – we have other internal options that could, you know, fill in on this team, the, the lack of options. Like, I mean, well, like, that's, what? that's what I was going to, I think it's, I think that's one of the battles in camp because you would think Merrifield puts Pache on the, on the outs. And I don't necessarily line up with that thinking. And I know it makes sense because, you know, he's right-handed and, and Jake Cave's left-handed. But the reality is that we're talking about Jake Cave is a legitimate candidate to make this roster for now. I am. Yeah, yeah I am a yeah. little bit. Um, uh, so I look at it and I say to myself, let's say Rojas isn't ready. Yeah. And Brandon Marsh is not having a spring. Are you just cutting ties with Christian Pache and have nobody to play center field? Yeah, it's tough. Like, like that, like to me, I think you have to hang on to Pache for a little bit. I mean, you may not, he may not be here all year. But I think he's a guy that has to be part of your of your mix, and if if the if the loss ends up being Jake Cave because he's also out of options. Sorry, Jake Cave. Like we'll go find yeah. another left-handed bat kind of thing. Yeah. Like that. Like that's you know it, that, that's the the thing to me. It's like yeah, I you know the, that was the one spot where I thought maybe they would have preferred another lefty who could do that and replace cave and then you still keep Pache because of the versatility yeah. in the outfield and his defense and everything and he can hit lefties a little bit um so I, that was the one thing that maybe that <laughs> maybe it's why that's why it took so long to get Merrifield um but at the same time I, I can't see them abandoning the only other center field possibility on their 40-man roster yeah so yeah. like I, I I part of me says I see what they're doing, but I, I also don't see them getting rid of Pache either. I guess there's two different ways to talk about the other. I don't want to say necessarily a concern because I like the Philly starting rotation. But, you know, th they've sort of done this thing where it's like they've just wiped away the last seven years and they started looking at 2015, you know, with a lot of these late ads as, as yeah. camp is kind of revving up here. Are you – I guess there's a couple different ways to ask this. like. Are you cool with the Phillies starting five right now as is? Um, would you like to see them maybe start kicking the tires on Montgomery if this continues to drag on and you, you can get them on a two- or three-year deal? Okay. Um, like, Where do you sort of evaluate this? And like, Do do the David Buchanans of the world do anything for you? No. Because like, this is what we do every spring, right? Like, no. and, and listen, I, I give this guy a lot of credit. You know, He's in his, his mid-30s, pushing into his mid-30s. He sort of reinvented himself. Some of the stuff is sort of played up. Like the fact that he was able to get a contract, like is a testament to him because he was an afterthought seven years ago. Mm -hmm. So good for him. And I'm not, I don't want to write him off. And if you're a beat writer and you're down there covering the Phillies, like you write that story because it's, it's interesting. Right. I suspect, and I could be woefully wrong that come mid May, like we look back on it and like, remember the, Remember the late February David Buchanan stories? Like, ha, ha, ha. Like, you had to write it, but who gives a shit? Like, right. I, I just don't know that they have enough. Or I, I don't know that they have that guy right now 
as rotational depth. So I'm kind of just interested to know where you're at right now on that front. Well, I it, it I am a little concerned about the starting pitching um, because I think that you're pretty solid with your top three. And then after that, it becomes a question to me. I hope that Christopher Sanchez has the same kind of year that he had last year where he was That's a the best case for him that he just replicates last year. Or do you think that there's a step forward there? Or? Well, there could be a step forward. I mean, he's got to get, he's got to get better throwing the sinker. I mean, that changeup is lethal. It was last year. I think I've, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I think teams hit like 168 against the changeup last year. I mean, and, and, you know, there was a lot of swing and miss on it too. Um, so that's, that's really good. That's a really good pitch. Um, and, and he was so much better at not walking guys, which was, was, was his big bugaboo prior to last season. Um, so, so good, good on him. And if he can keep doing that, that's great, but he gets, his sinker gets torched and you can't rely on a guy for more than a five inning Kyle Kendrick type start. Right. If in fact you can't throw a fastball past people. Right. And that's like, so that to me is a little bit of a concern. I hope it develops. I hope he continues to go forward because, you know, you root for a guy like that uh, who was a little bit of a long shot and then all of a sudden becomes an important player. That's a great story. I don't have any confidence whatsoever in Taiwan Walker. None. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's such a strange thing and I don't get it. I don't understand it. I've never seen it in the sport of baseball where a guy can can't pitch worth a damn for an inning and a third or inning and two thirds. And then all of a sudden he finds it and can pitch for four or five more innings really well. Like I've never seen anything like this. Um, and, and I don't quite grasp how it works, but if he's my number five, I, I, I could get by with it. I could, I go, all right, I'm not happy with it, but okay. I'll show you. Know, there are just, much worse number fives in baseball than Taiwan Walker. I, I'm with you there. Uh, if you listen to the show last year, you know it's pretty critical of Taiwan Walker. Um, I will say, and I, you know who this person is. We, I obviously can't say who, but you know who this person is. They, they intimated to me that he was sort of gutting it out for the team uh, at points last year. That he was was injured, and that like not like injured to the point where he couldn't take the ball, but like injured to the point where it was affecting his performance and he was a professional and just shut up and didn't make excuses and kind of gutted it out. And, you know, so much so that it sort of explained the way that his games flowed a little bit. Okay. I, I don't know. Right. Like I hear that and I go, okay, like, I don't know that that's true. I have to kind of take it for what it, it's, yeah. you know, what the guy's saying. Yeah. I know what you're talking about. yeah. There's, there's part of me though, that goes, okay, like maybe, but then there's the like the accountable viewer part of you, observer of the game part of you that's like that's great and all, but like if you can't do the job, you can't do the job. So it's it's kind of tough. There's I guess I say that to say this, it's like I'm willing to allow for the possibility that Taiwan Walker gives them some quality starts and eats up some innings and is a functional number four, number five type starter this year. Do I feel great about it? No. Uh, certainly he's motivated, right? He, he, we all saw that on Twitter. Like we saw at the end of last season that he's super motivated. So we know that. But I just don't, I don't know. You know, yeah. we'll we'll see, I guess. But to your point, like those are two pretty big question marks. And then like, oh, by the way, let me just give you this real quick. Uh, I'm just going to throw some numbers at you. 306, 202. 319, 306, 234. And what those numbers represent is batting average against by month against Ranger Suarez last year. Like, do I feel great about Ranger Suarez in an important game? I do. I, I think that he's a good pitcher. I, I like Ranger Suarez. But, like, this idea that, like, Ranger Suarez is going to be good for 30 starts, I don't. I guess I don't have the same confidence in that as everyone else seems to. Now, last year he was a little bit behind schedule. He's there now. So, like, I think that he he's certainly poised and positioned to be in a better spot to maintain some consistency. That consistency was not there last year. No. And so, like, to say, like, well, he's our number three. Okay. Then, oh, by the way, like, I 
think you should feel good about Aaron Nola. I think I'm, I've arrived back at the, like, I like Aaron Nola. He's a really good number two, but that was not exactly a sure thing last year. Like, I, I, I know that like a lot of the, the predictive models and a lot of the advanced metrics loves this rotation. And I see how you get there, but I don't feel as confident as some people do. I, yeah. I guess and for that, no, reason, I, like I'd keep looking if I were them. Yeah. And so when you, you mentioned Montgomery and, and, and I think that that's a really interesting case because the, I, you know, we heard the Phillies tied to him so many times in the off season, right? Oh, they're interested in Montgomery. They're looking at Montgomery. They're talking to Montgomery. Well, that doesn't just come out of nowhere, right? That the people are saying that. And, um, you know, obviously the Phillies don't want to make a long-term commitment to him, and I get it. But maybe they understand that the market's going to come down to he's not going to get what he's looking for. He's going to have to settle for something a little bit less. And if that's the case, they say, they say, come back and talk to us when you're willing to yeah. take a two- or three-year deal. And if that's the case... Phillies are right. They're going to be competitive with any team in baseball as far as money. So what does that, what does that do? For I would the be Phillies? interested in what that. Does, what does Jordan Montgomery do for the Phillies? I mean, obviously he addresses some of the concerns that I just expressed, but yeah, does that take Sanchez and bump him out and make him more of like that flex bullpen long guy type piece, maybe a maybe. spot harder? Because to me, I think you will see what happens in spring training. A guys get hurt. Right. And, and B certainly performance will dictate some of how they align this thing. But just if you, had to project it out on February 19th right now. I think that Sanchez is the odd guy out of the rotation, not Taiwan Walker. Probably, probably right. I, I think first the financial considerations of it, but also just from a clubhouse that we used the word political last year. I think like there's, I, I think you, he, I don't believe can perform out of the bullpen is also a part of it. Right. So I think like he has to have every opportunity to try to maintain that starting spot. And then you sort of go from there. Yeah. And, and I think that, and I also think that Sanchez's stuff probably plays a little bit better in a, in a multi-inning relief role. Yeah. I mean, really, I mean, I, you know, that, that change up is a devastating pitch. And, and if you can concentrate it on saying, Hey, listen, now you're only going to throw two innings instead of five, right? Maybe then you could get, a little bit more velocity on that sinker and, and maybe you get a little makes it a little bit tougher on your on batters maybe you can have a little bit more than you would normally as a starter um and then you can just you you just pepper them with those change-ups and it's going to be different from what they were already seeing the first couple times at the plate today so like I, things like that can it could make him a little bit more <laughs> valuable as a as a swiss army knife type of type of pitcher um so yeah i think you're right that that would be the case sanchez would be the guy that gets moved to the bullpen but then, boy, are you really left-handed heavy? Yeah. Every, all of a sudden, for, for a team that never had a lot of lefties, you would I have know. three lefties in your rotation, right? Or two, or two lefties in your rotation and four lefties in the bullpen. You'd have six lefties on your on your pitching staff. It's just truly crazy. It was one of the things that we talked about so much though last year. I mean, Taiwan Walker's first inning last year in thirty one <laughs> starts. It's ridiculous. Seven oh four ERA. It's ridiculous. Opponents hit three ten against him with an eight eighty eight OPS. I mean, it is wild. And and just like real quick here, first inning. Se- this is ERA. 7.04, second inning, 390, third inning, 450, fourth inning, 460, fifth inning, 415, sixth inning, 1.00, seventh inning, 352. Now, obviously, he wasn't getting to the sixth and seventh a ton, but like, not that any of these numbers are electric by any means, but like, you even go like batting average against like the fourth, fifth, and sixth inning, 232, 252, 088. Like, not bad. You know, but that first inning, it was just such a disaster and consistently so. Like, if you go back and look at it start by start, it's not like, oh, well, you know, that's misleading. He had over a five-game stretch, one really bad first inning. The other four were clean. I mean, it was every time so, out. So here's the thing. If, in fact, he was injured and was, and, was, and was fighting through it, was gutting it out for the team, once the season was over, why didn't they tell us that? This is like like a thing that happens all the time. No, but you know what I'm saying? Like, it, it's it's one of those things that you're like you're trying to look for a reason as to why this guy who you signed to a $72 million contract was ineffective, right? And maybe you don't want to say it in the season because it's, you know, oh, we don't want the other teams to know that he's pitching with a little, he's a little banged up and we don't want them to know. 
But then after the season's over, when it doesn't matter anymore, and you need to come up with an explanation and be like, well, yeah, he was he was pitching through yeah, something. That's the thing. That's like I kind of look at it and I go like, that's why I'm not like I'm certainly not reporting that he was. No, but that's I I hear you, and but that's what I'm saying. Like, it, like if but if it's true, I'm saying if it's true, tell us because yeah. then then the spotlight isn't as harsh on Taiwan Walker. We're not sitting there criticizing every first inning of every start that he has. Because it's like, well, okay, he was going through. So, all right, we can kind of at least understand it a little bit. Come out and tell us that. Like, I don't understand why that has to still be, you know, this major. Yeah, well, it's funny secret. you say that. It's funny you say that because I'm, I'm kind of going through that with the Eagles a little bit. So yeah. I'm watching, um, you know, you watch the Eagles unfold this year. And I'm saying to myself, like, man, you know, we all said it. Like, oh, Jalen Hurts just doesn't quite look the same. And I don't yeah. just even mean from like a production standpoint, just from like a, you know, an it's athletic cool. standpoint. Yeah. Like, just didn't quite have the same, you know, agility, maybe like the same, like, you know, the, the, maybe not even straight line speed was there. It was like, okay, fine. But like, there just wasn't the same, you know, shiftiness. Right. And you go back and you like, you're like, am I, was this just never there? Like, am I just imagining this? And I, I one time I, I went back and I pulled open the, uh, the highlights of the Eagles Packers Sunday night game from 2022. <laughs> and I'm just watching this guy move. And I'm like, damn like he was moving he does not look like that guy right now yeah and so i like a lot of people they get to the end of the season and i'm thinking like we're gonna get the jalen hurts knee scope story you know not that he was so injured that he couldn't play but like yeah there was obviously something going on there we had to take care of it <laughs> now we're a month out and that story hasn't come and i went oh my god like is it just deterioration like is that all it was uh you know so it's funny like i mean you do you, you do hear that, though, and sometimes it doesn't come out right away. Sometimes it comes out the, the, the start of the next season. Like, oh, yeah, you know, he actually was dealing with this last year. So, I mean, we'll we'll see. I, 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 you know, I don't know to what degree he was impacted physically, Taiwan Walker, but, um, you know, certainly I think everybody understands he's got to be better. I do expect that he will probably be in this rotation, even with the addition of a guy like Montgomery. I would – strongly advise that the Phillies maybe add a more meaningful piece to the dissertation. Uh, you know, that's, that's my other big concern right now. And, and I think it would be better if you can do it here in free agency with, with mm -hmm. the, with a guy like Montgomery, I think rather than have to cross your fingers and hope that it works in the season. And then if it's not, mm -hmm. then you have to give up assets to yeah. get it right. Yeah. And, and yeah, look, <laughs> is it possible that a guy like David Buchanan comes in and and gives you a Bailey Falter type 2022, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and you know, and yeah. and you're like, oh my God, where did this guy come from? What a great story this is! It's unbelievable. Okay, cool. That would be a cool story if David Buchanan came in and whatever, right? And, or any of these guys, Colby Allard came, you know, finally realizes his potential that he had when he was with the Braves, or kind of thing. Like any one of those those non roster guys that they're bringing in. Uh, or or depth guys that they're bringing in that would be an awesome story but the reality of it is is you're trying to win a world championship you got to go and get the best players that you think can win right now and you're not crossing your fingers and hoping for a high reward on a low well, wouldn't it be nice to have uh one of the top three prospects in the entire sport uh that kind of projects as a number one frontline starter that's drawn comparisons to a guy like justin verlander like wouldn't it be nice to have someone like him in this rotation <laughs> uh, yes it would yes it would yeah. the last I mean, are you like, are you like real quick and i want to i want to wrap this up because february and march get long when you're recording twice a week yeah but uh like i'm looking at mick abel right now and i go yeah. like he's 22 he's he, he doesn't even turn 23 for another six months yeah like don't you kind of feel like this is entirely unfair but like don't you just kind of feel like oh yeah it's mick abel like we're talking about this guy again and He's like not really quite knocking on the door. Like he's only 22. Like he, he's yeah. he's not that, you know, he doesn't I probably should not have the fatigue when I hear his name the way that I do. You know, in order like in to be fair to him. But I'm like, okay, like it'd be nice if like we were talking about like can Mick Abel make a push here, you know? Like yeah. not there and yet. I, and I think that the problem is with that is and again, this is just goes to show the lack of depth in the Phillies mm -hmm. organization because they have a couple of nice young players, of course, and Mick Abel's one of them, 
But when you only have a couple, you hear the same names over and over and over and over again. And so it's so so then it seems like we've been talking about this guy for forever. Well, you really haven't, right? But it's just that there's nobody else to talk about. So so that's what it becomes, right? So that's you're right. It becomes unfair to Mick Abel. Yeah. Uh, And and Griff McGarry. And and, you know, for sure. You know, these guys get made out to be we actually went through this what back in like the the 2010 range, right? Like the baby aces. You remember that? Yeah. Yeah. The the one last thing I wanted to talk about the Phillies before we get to one last thing. Um who's closing games for you this year, Bob? (laughs) If you had to like do a betting odds right now, like is it are we going by the committee? Is it Kirkering? Is it is it Alvarado? Is it Dominguez? I don't think it's Dominguez based on performance last year. I mean, I, dude, I, I don't know. I, I so here's the thing with that, and that's I'm, this is why I wanted to bring it up because I think they want it to be Dominguez. <sighs> I think that they that, like in their heart of hearts they sit there and go, he's got the closer stuff. The question is, does he have the confidence to be that guy? Yeah, and they want that's what they want to yeah. see. And if he doesn't, he doesn't. And then he's just what he was last year again, kind of, you know, whatever mid 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 inning role you need him in, right? But they, but they I, have so many big arms back there with so much upside, but it's just like who is the guy? Like even a guy like Hoffman, like he showed you yeah. you like want to talk about balls and like confidence. Yeah. Like yeah. I need to see it again. You know, like yeah. there is like there's definitely a little I don't want to say skepticism, but like, hey, great year. Can Do it you, again carry that over and i yeah. you know there's reason to believe he will like but just from a mentality standpoint like okay yeah like that that dude was he was like a killer you know yeah. um with dominguez like you felt like you were watching a guy that just did not trust himself so often last year so how do you kind of put him at the front of the line right now like can he emerge there yeah i think there's like four names right now in the back of that bullpen that could ultimately lead the phillies and saves through the month of may yeah. you know like those first 60 days first 60 games like who the hell knows yeah no i got i got to got the sense that they like alvarado against the heart of a lineup yeah, earlier like the yeah. seventh or eighth inning right if it, whatever <laughs> whenever they deal they deem is the big spot in the in the big lineup with the lefties coming up that's when they're going to go to alvarado yeah. it might be the sixth might be the seventh might be the eighth but i don't think that they look at him as a closer in the okay so here you go question over under three and a half uh phillies relievers earn a save in the month of april oh over yeah yeah <laughs> yeah I, I mean i literally i could see it be i could see alvarado getting one i could see uh uh dominguez getting one i could see kirkering i could see yeah. soto as a possibility, yeah. like they they think Soto, I think is going to have a, a better year than he had last he year. He better, he better. So, you know, I, I like him. I, I like him a lot, yeah. and I understood the trade. I thought the yeah. trade was a slam dunk. Um, for the way that he throws the baseball, like he has got to be more productive than he was last year. Yeah. So I it, it, so to me, that's the that's the big question. I I don't think it's going to be Kirkering. I, he needs to he needs to throw something other than the slider more frequently. Do you feel like that last year helped or hurt him? I mean, I think. And I, I mean, and I, I think the answer, the obvious answer, is that it helped him. Yeah. I mean, I guess from like a perception standpoint, like, do you think like I, I kind of get the sense like some people are like, yeah, all right, like sounds good, man. Like I watched that last October. It wasn't. It wasn't awesome. Um, I feel like that's kind of unfair to the kid. You know, like I, I feel like you people should be excited about what what he could be. And I don't yeah. think that his performance last year should shape, you know, negatively the way that he is viewed coming in. I don't think the Phillies feel that way. I think the Phillies are like, yeah, this this guy's it. Yeah. Um, but like, you know how it goes. Like, I struggled in some big spots, and now you're like, yeah, like we really think that Kirkering could close games, and you're like, yeah, okay, well, I guess we'll see. Yeah. There is yeah, like a I, little bit. Do you feel that a little bit? I feel like there is a little bit of of that with him. You know. Yeah. I do, and I think it's unfair to him too. I mean, he pitched what three three innings in the regular season and what four in the in the playoffs. I mean, it's not like you saw a lot from the kid, yeah. right? Um, and there's no doubt that that slider plays mm-hmm. in, at this level. It's really good. The problem is he threw it what eighty percent of the time, yeah. and that's the issue. And so, like, if if that's what you're going to expect out of him, he's yeah. not going to succeed, and right. that does, and that will hurt him. Um, so he needs to throw his fastball more more frequently. And with more regularity. And if he does and he gets some swing and miss on it, then, you know, 
and then I think you're okay. Then I think he yeah. will be he will be a dude back there for you. Um, yeah, and 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 as far as Dominguez, he has to throw strikes in the zone. So just throw pitches in the zone. You throw 97, 98, 99, and you throw that hard, put it yeah. over the plate and see if guys can hit you. I, I think you you may not miss every bat, but you're not gonna you're gonna induce weak contact if you avoid the barrel, right? I mean, so like just put it there. Don't try and don't try and be cute and, and throw it outside the zone. That's what killed Dominguez last year. Too many yeah. walks. So I think if he can be more aggressive in the zone, he can get back to what he was the season before, two seasons before. That's the that's what I think that they're they're hoping for out of him. So the bullpen's gonna be interesting. It's gonna be for sure. Absolutely. All right. Well, let's uh let's get to one last thing here. So one last thing. I actually have a, a two parter here. Um, the first one I just want to kind of throw out there that one of my favorite things in spring training is seeing guys who like a David Buchanan who are like, oh my God, where did this guy, where has he been all this time coming back and giving, taking a shot and trying to make a team? And I always look around the league and see, and you know, you got Ken Giles in Atlanta, which is kind of a fun one to watch. How about, uh, 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 Kung Fu Panda, Pablo Sandoval. Uh, I saw that. I it with that the Giants. A, oh, that was a joke when I saw it. <laughs> yeah. He was playing in Mexico last year, and then he he was drafted in that Saudi Arabian baseball league, right? And so I was like, "Holy cow!" Where you know is that what hits become of him? He's now thirty seven, back with the Giants. So like those those kinds of things. Yeah, those kinds. My of question things. is, what is his what is his physique like these days? Is he is he still like got the, the, the panda thing going on or is he a trim right? and trim guy at this point? Yeah, I, don't yeah know. I know. But it's fun. Like I always look for that. And I always root for guys who, you know, you don't expect to come out. They come out of nowhere and you're just like, oh, wow, yeah. I haven't heard that name in forever. And now they're trying to make it back to the big leagues. I, I love the, the fact that they don't let the dream die. And I, I, I think yeah. that that's kind of a cool thing. But I the think my, one... my most recent memory of him was uh was I might have this wrong, but I feel like it was Nola opening day, maybe home opener against the Braves a couple Braves. years ago. Twenty one, yeah. He's cruising along, and Sandoval just crushes one. I'm like, yeah. What are we doing? You know? Yeah. So that's, that's exactly that's what it was. My last memory of him. That's right. But no, the real one last thing that I wanted to get to, Bob, and this is the thing I think is a is conversation worthy. Rob Manfred, five more years, mm. and then he's going to retire. So that will be it. He will retire at the end of that. But I don't know. I mean, you're going to let him lord over the next contract negotiation with the union mm-hmm. as as much as the players dislike him as a, as a commissioner. And that union is I, I like to me, I thought that that was a mistake by Major League Baseball. I really did. I, and it's not a, it's I don't think he's a good commissioner to begin with, but to give him that kind of extension and knowing that he has to do one more negotiation with the with the union on a con on a collective bargaining agreement, I fear for the sport that we have another work stoppage. Yeah. I actually think that the worst thing is that that, that deal does not need to be extended until I believe you play the 24, 25 and 26 seasons. Correct. I don't think time is, is Manfred's friend. I right. actually think that, that all of that animosity and a lot of the tension is just only going to continue to get worse between now and then. If Correct. you said, Hey, they got to do a deal at the end of this season. I'd say like, okay, like, yeah, I, I, I don't think that that thing gets better. I'll put it to you that way. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, you might be onto something with that. Yeah. I'm, uh, that, that concerns me a little bit for the sport. So yeah. that was the one that, that was like, Oh man, when I saw that, I was like, oh. We're gonna have a lot. We're gonna have a lot of long breaks <laughs> after that contract negotiation. <laughs> the People's Commissioner, some yeah. call. Yeah. All so. right. Well, uh, it's good to get back uh, in here and uh, talking Phillies again. Uh, we will be back later this week, probably Thursday, Friday, uh, yeah. and try to maintain that that schedule moving forward. Um, anything else you want to kind of shout out or call out before we get out of here? No, no, I'm excited yeah. to do this again. I was like, it was so fun when you announced it on on Twitter yesterday, and people were like, "It's about damn time." Yeah. Where are you yeah, guys I been? Some, I had some people in the DMs. I think yeah, I was complaining so I. about the. We didn't talk about this. We don't need to. But I was complaining about the jerseys, like everybody else. Oh my and god, what are they? Are they the bad? tweet kind of blew up, and people were like, "Yeah, cool, I agree," but like, where's crossed up? So <laughs> I figured, all right, all right, all right. Like, here we are. We're here. We're here. We're gonna be breaking down every at bat of Philly spring training. You know. It'll be By the way, oh, that's the announcement I'll give you. I'll be there. There you again go. This year, I'll Very be down good. there from the third to the thirteenth of March. Uh, so you know, get a bunch of stories. We'll do a couple shows while I'm down there. Uh, so it'll be good. It'll be fun. Excellent. 
All right. Yeah. Very good. Well, uh, thank you for tuning in. You can follow Anthony on X. Are we officially calling it X now? I still don't. I still right, call well, You can follow him on whatever you want to call the app at Ansan Philly. You can follow me at Bob underscore Wank. We'll make sure that you are checking us out on uh, YouTube, Spotify, anywhere that you get your shows. And we will talk to you soon.